Hi everybody, this is Rena Cha speaking from Georgetown University Hospital, and I'd like to discuss with you today MRI pre- and post-liver transplant. So if we think about our goals for pre-liver transplant imaging, they really are to support our surgical colleagues. We want to be able to tell them, is there cirrhosis? Are the vessels open? Are there masses? And if there are, what are they? And is there portal hypertension? The morphological changes that we see with cirrhosis can be varied. It can be micronodular or macronodular. You may see changes in architecture, the presence of fibrosis, varying iron deposition patterns, and of course, ascites and other stigmata of portal hypertension. So if we think about cirrhosis, certainly we can see nodular surface. We can see lots of that, and it makes it relatively easy in that sense. Sometimes the other features we'll see is a right hepatic notch sign, which is often tucked in between segment five and six of the liver. You may see these small nodules around edges of the liver, as in this case, okay, micronodular changes. Or you may see macronodular changes, large nodules or hypertrophic changes, as in this case, we have a large caudate, a big left lateral segment, which can often be seen nicely on a coronal image, and the empty gallbladder fossa sign, which is related to the atrophic changes of segment four and segment five of the liver. All of these are felt to be changes uh, that develop because of alterations in portal venous flow. The revised caudate ratio can be helpful. So if you look at the branch pattern of the first uh, branch of the right portal vein and you follow it to the caudate and compare it to the right hepatic lobe, a ratio that's one or greater of the caudate to the right is also helpful to be able to tell whether the patient has cirrhosis. Other features that one may see is widening of the periportal space by greater than 10 millimeters, as in this case. One may also see the entire changes of low bar atrophic and hypertrophic complexes. So here we have massive enlargement of the caudate lobe, as we can see here, but relatively atrophic changes of the remainder of the liver. And after infusion of contrast, again, this central hypertrophy is very classic of this um, entity in patients with sclerosing cholangitis or other biliary types of cirrhosis. It can be seen in all sets, types of cirrhosis, but particularly in biliary type cirrhosis. So the hypertrophic atrophic changes can be very helpful. Other features can be changes in morphology of the liver. So you can see a reticular pattern in this patient who's got changes of um, certainly of areas of fibrosis. But notice sometimes that you can see these band-like areas of abnormal signal intensity on T1 and T2 weighted images, these sheet-like areas. And notice also that the patient has gamma antibodies as a stigmata of portal hypertension. After infusion of contrast, those band-like areas show progressive enhancement, which is very typical of areas of confluent fibrosis. And um, that can be very helpful to tell that the patient has the ancillary features that we see with cirrhosis. Notice also that when we're looking at these patients, it's really important to pay attention to the vascular maps. So the surgeons need to know about patency of the vessels. Our friends in IR need to know about this before they're going in to do interventional procedures. So I like to give them a vascular map of the hepatic arteries. And very important to look at the sagittal reconstruction of the celiac and the superior mesenteric artery, because once this bad liver goes into the bucket and to the pathologist lab, and a new liver comes in, we want to make sure that the inflow coming in to feed those bile ducts is nicely maintained. So we always look for celiac axis stenosis or median arcuate ligament compression and make sure we put that into our reports. The portal vein patency is really important. Here you can see the main portal vein is thrombosed with numerous varices. It's very important to tell them the degree of thrombosis, how long it is, where it extends, so that they can revise this and think about doing a, um, a graft that, that bypasses the thrombosed vessel. It's really important also to look at the hepatic veins and the IBC and make sure those are open. So all of those are really important to be able to plan surgically for those patients. One of the other goals, obviously, diagnosis of focal lesions, including HCC. So let's talk about that a little bit. So we all know about the risk for HCC. I think every one of you knows that this is related to long-standing liver inflammation, and that leads to HCC. The really important concepts that I want you to remember for this are as follows. Number one, hepatitis B is directly oncogenic. This virus will cause the development of HCC without preceding cirrhosis. So think about that in those patients. In hepatitis C, there's often much, a much more stepwise change between fibrosis, then cirrhosis, then the development of HCC. 
Another really important thing to remember is that cirrhosis and chronic hepatitis both are risk factors for the development of intrahepatic glandular carcinoma. So you can see both ICC and HCC um, in these patients, sometimes even in the same patient. So it's very important to think about that. And if we think about the knowledge of hepatic carcinogenesis, people think of it as either stepwise or de novo. The bottom line is that there are changes in blood flow. There are abnormal unpaired arterioles. There's a decrease in the portal venous flow and, and change in the receptors on these cells. So these are the OP receptors that are important, obviously, in those patients that we image with um, hepatocellular contrast agents. However, as the tumors get bigger or they are dedifferentiated or they are progressing um, to poorly differentiated HCC, the arterial flow may diminish and you might not see the classic enhancement pattern. A third of these patients have multifocal disease, so it's very important to look at that and look for multiple sites when we're looking at these patients. So if we think about cirrhosis-associated nodules, it's present in all livers. The pathologists feel them. And these are micronodular, less than 3 millimeters, or macronodular, greater than 3 millimeters. And these can be up to several centimeters. They're variable signal on T1. They have low signal intensity on T2. They do not have arterial phase enhancement, and they maintain portal venous flow. They can look like areas of low signal intensity on later phase images because of the surrounding fibrosis, which I'll show you in a minute. So here we've got a typical case, cirrhosis-associated regenerative nodules or cirrhosis-associated nodules. Notice multiple nodules best seen on the pre-contrast T1-weighted images as these areas of slightly increased signal intensity next to these areas of fibrosis often invisible on these early phase images, but notice on the delayed phase, we can see these small little areas as diminished signal intensity surrounded by these areas of fibrosis. And after a while, they all look like each other, don't they? It's like that Sesame Street strong, I, I tell my residents. One of these does not look like the other, right? So these guys all look like the other. They all look like their neighbor. So those are very typical of cirrhosis associated nodules. Dysplastic nodules, on the other hand, they're found in up to a quarter of patients, and these are just different, and they're different both macroscopically, based on what the pathologist sees, or microscopically from the background uh, parenchyma. If they're low-grade, they look just like cirrhosis-associated nodules. If they're high-grade, they can look just like well-differentiated HCC. So usually they're iso-intense on T1 and T2. They may have fat. Some retain copper, and they can have increased signal intensity on T1. These should not have increased signal intensity on T2. They should not show arterial phase enhancement. So here we've got this nodule. That's what I, you know, the term is distinctive. Why? It's a little bit different than its neighbor. It stands out. One of these is not like the others, right? So here we can look at it, see that it is a little darker on the T2, a little whiter on the T1, but its enhancement pattern is not really showing it to be any different from the rest. So this is really a dysplastic or regenerative nodule. I don't know what it is but I know that there's nothing here that really worries me about it. Now, let's talk about the concept of dysplastic nodules with HCCs, the so-called nodule and nodule appearance. These can have variable appearances on T1 and T2, but the most important thing is we see arterialization. So let's look at this case. We have a distinctive nodule. This is greater than two centimeters, a whole bunch of background nodules. Notice this guy stands out as compared to the background, right? So the Sesame Street song comes in again. Here we can see after infusion of intravenous contrast, it enhances, but very similarly to the rest of these background nodules. However, the patient comes back six months later, and this is what we see. The nodule is slightly larger, but it has an abnormal central focus that's brighter on the T1-weighted images, darker on the T, uh, excuse me, darker on the T1-weighted images, brighter on the T2-weighted images. And after infusion of contrast, it has irregular stippled enhancement, some areas that look kind of a mosaic pattern with some areas of washout. This is the classic nodule and nodule appearance of HCCs described by my colleague and mentor, Don Mitchell, years and years ago, which still is used to this day. So if we think about the diagnosis of HCC, the most critical thing that we need to remember is that you have to have arterial phase enhancement, and washout. Certainly there can be variable signal on, on T1 and T2-weighted images, sometimes T, uh, often t increased signal intensity on T2-weighted images, but the most important thing is arterial phase hyper-enhancement with washout. 
We can see growth over time. We may see the presence of a capsule. But this combination allows us to make a near 100% specific diagnosis of HEC. So here in a case, we can see, as compared to the background liver, we can see hypervascular enhancement as compared to the background. Notice that it washes out. It's darker than the background liver. Notice that it's got a very well-defined, beautiful capsule that's best seen on the portal venous phase or later phase images. This is diagnostic features of an HCC. This is an LR5 or LIRADS5, by, according to LIRADS criteria. Beautiful example of this. This patient also has a mass that we can see, obviously, dominant mass in between segment 5 and 6, arterial phase enhancement, washout, beautiful example of a capsule, and here we can see a tumor capsule and pathology. Now, a capsule is important because you see it in HCC. You do not see a capsule in dysplastic nodules nor with cholangiocarcinoma. So it's really important to look for that as well as a feature of HCC. Of course, when we're looking at these patients, we're also looking for ancillary features. Well, what are some ancillary features? Here we can see in this patient that I'd shown you earlier on the T1 weighted images as compared to the out of phase images. In phase, out of phase. We can see loss of signal of this focus. There's definitely intralesional fat in this. Note that this has increased signal intensity on the T2 weighted images, yet another ancillary feature of HTC. So we think about this and the other ancillary features. Mild hyperintensity. I tell my residents, look at what it looks like as compared to the spleen. Is it the whiteness of spleen or the whiteness of CSF? So the whiteness of spleen is kind of what the way I like to think about it. Think about interlesional fat. Think about the mosaic architecture. Think about high signal intensity on the long B-value diffusions or restricted diffusion on the ADC maps. Look for areas of iron sparing in an iron overloaded liver. Look for intralesional hemorrhage. All of those will lead you to the site of HCC. In this patient, we can see in phase and out of phase images. Notice there are several lesions here, two of these right here. We can see this lesion actually has loss of signal on the out of phase images that is nightly shown on subtraction images. Notice also abnormal signal intensity on T2 weighted images. And after infusion of contrast, there's arterialization here, there's washout, there's a part of the capsule. We can see similar features in, this, in the other lesion next to it. This is a pattern that shows arterial phase enhancement. Notice the stippled appearance in here. This is the mosaic attenuation, a mosaic pattern of enhancement that's described in patients with uh, HCC. This patient has a lesion that's very subtle, and I would challenge you on a busy day to be able to find this, but if we have our friend's diffusion, we are able to see that there are two foci very bright on the low B value. On the high B value, only one of them kind of hangs on, and here you can see this also has restricted diffusion, unlike the cyst next to it that is not. So if we look back, we're able to see nicely on the pre-contrast images, this vague area of dis abnormal signal intensity. Notice it's increased on T2 in arterially phase enhancement with washout. Very easy to walk through this very quickly on a busy day, but diffusion weighted images can be your friends. It's important to remember that diffusion weighted images, the sensitivity decreases with liver function and with better differentiation. So it may not necessarily help you, but you can use it um, as a tool when it does. Let's now talk about hypovascular HCCs. Up to 20 to 40% of HCCs don't have arterial phase enhancement. So these can be early HCCs, they may be poorly differentiated, they may be infiltrative HCCs, or quite frankly, the tiny hypervascular foci might be too small for you to perceive it. There may be technical limitations, either the arterial phase is mistimed or there are artifacts. All of these can lead to hypervascular HCCs. So it's really important to think about, oh, I think this is a malignancy, but I can't make a specific diagnosis because then you can lead your clinical colleagues to do the next best thing for that patient. Remember, we stage HCCs. It's purely radiological. So it's really important that we use this to inform the clinical decision-making, the triage treatment. Remember that we decide who is eligible for liver transplant. And if we're not sure to say we're not sure and think about teaming with our surgical colleagues and our clinical colleagues to make sure we're managing these patients in biopsy and determinate lesions. Remember, we can have malignancies such as cholangiocarcinomas in the same patients at risk for HCC.
Remember also that the Milan criteria is what is the T2 criteria for TNM staging for exception points for liver transplantation. So one HCC between the size of two to five centimeters or up to three nodules less than three centimeters allows the patient to get automatically these extra points that allow them to move up into the, these exception points that allow them to move up on the transplant list. So it's really important to remember those numbers when we're using our um, tools and when we are dictating these cases. So how do we improve specificity and consistency? We use LIRATS, liver imaging, reporting and data systems. This has been around for over a decade. I'm sure many of you are aware of them. You should start and learn this technique of using the system. It allows us to speak the same language as the clinicians. It allows us to define what we think is benign versus what we think is malignant versus what we think is diagnostic for HEC and to look for tumor in vain. All patterns, all features that are critical in managing these patients. Let's look at this case. Clinician comes by, Rena, can you take a look? This patient's on the transplant list. We just got him from an outside hospital. So here he is a patient with cirrhosis. There's ascites. We have a rim enhancing lesion within the cirrhotic liver. Notice that there's some capsular retraction. Notice that there's progressive enhancement. This is not diagnostic, right, for HCC. We've talked about those features already. So we also have an MR in this patient with a beautiful artifact going right through the teaching point, which makes me a little sad. But here you can see targetoid appearance on T2. Notice rim-like enhancement on the arterial phase with progressive enhancement. And notice that we have capsular retraction. So again, this does not meet the imaging features of HCC. We were concerned about this. The patient ended up getting a biopsy at our recommendation, and this ended up being, as expected, a cholangiocarcinoma. So LIRADS M basically says, I am a malignancy, but I am not definitively HCC. So we could it could be an HCC, could be a cholangio, could be a biphenotypic tumor, could be an angiosarcoma or something else. So we need to say, we don't know, but we're very concerned that this represents malignancy. Different patient, the same concept, it's morphologically cirrhotic liver. We have a focus of abnormal signal intensity in segment six of the liver on T1 and T2 weighted images. And after the infusion of intravenous contrast, rim-like enhancement that we can see that is progressive and on delayed phase, notice that it is completely filled in. This is imaging features again that do not meet diagnostic criteria for HCC. This is an LRM. This was also a patient with a cholangiocarcinoma. Now let's go on to talk about this entity. Here we have a large mass centered within the liver, but notice that it also has abnormality next to it on into the portal venous system. Notice the mass has arterial phase enhancement. It has washout. It has a portion of a capsule, but the tubular structure next to it that bridges into the portal vein has very similar imaging features. Here's the main portal vein and the right and here we can see enhancement throughout that region with washout. This is a mass that represents tumor in vein. Now the incidence of malignant portal venous or hepatic venous thrombus is five to 44%. The most important thing that you can do in these patients is be absolutely sure without any question that there is enhancing soft tissue in that vein. You may or may not see a mass. Sometimes it's so infiltrative you won't see the mass but it's really important to be 100% sure because this is really a huge difference in the patient's treatment. You may see occluded veins with ill-defined walls. You may see some areas of restricted diffusion. You may be able to see a malignant mass in the adjacent area, heterogeneous enhancement, but it's not artifact. You, these are suggestive, but this is diagnostic. It's really important to pay attention to that. This is a patient who's got a, an abnormality within the right portal vein to the main portal vein, at the right very close to the takeoff. Notice on the outer phase images, this lesion actually has a little bit of loss of signal. And on T2-weighted images, it's of increased signal as compared to rapid flowing blood vessels that we've seen before. Now on this, you can see after infusion of contrast, there's stippled a hypervascular enhancement. That stippling persists on later phase images. The patient also had an ultrasound that showed arterialization of that blood flow. And at the time of angio, uh, angio, you can see this incredible tumor blush representing neovascularity in this patient with tumor in vein.
The classic descriptor was described by an angiographer and the so-called threads and streaks appearance. And I find it very helpful even when I'm looking at cases now. Here we can see expansile soft tissue within the portal venous system. Unlike the rapid flow in other vessels that we'll see dark on T2, here we can see grays on T2. Notice the expansion on T1, the stippled threads and streaks appearance throughout the arterial and portal venous phase images and throughout the later phase in this patient with infiltrative malignancy. This is a CT example of this threads and streaks appearance. Beautiful case of large, expansile, horrible tumor thrombus throughout the portal venous system with neovascularity. This is a more difficult case. Expansile portal vein, infiltrative tumor, very difficult to see its margins on the T2 or even on the post contrast, but notice without any doubt between these studies, well, we saw areas of stippled enhancement within this and that was shown on subtraction images as well as infiltrative tumor throughout. Tumor in vein with infiltrative disease often is very hypervascular, so we need to put it together with all of the other features. This patient had an alpha feta protein that was in the 20,000 range. Compare it to this case. This is a patient who's got a small filling defect on T1-rated images. On post-contrast images, there's a large hepatic artery, but a black appearing thrombus within the main portal vein. And notice on the late phase images, sometimes the perivenular collaterals will fill it in. So you don't want to look here, you want to look at the portal venous phase. This is the main portal vein caught again on the main portal venous phase. As I tell the residents, black as night. That is the classic imaging feature of tumor in vein. Now let's look at this case. Notice how different this case is. So this is a patient who's got a tiny little filling defect that you can see on the T1 rated images. Notice on the arterial phase images there's a large artery but no enhancement of that portal vein as seen on the portal venous phase. It's important not to look at the late phase images because the perivenular collaterals can start to fill in the portal venous thrombus. In this different patient notice that the portal confluence is thrombosed and notice on the portal venous phase as I like to tell the residents, this is black as night. This is very typical of patients with bland thrombus. Very different look as compared to the patient that I just showed you. So remember the differences between this patient who's got bland thrombus and the patient who's got tumor in vein. Very, very different look with this threads and streaks appearance that we can see in these patients. So it's a very important uh, uh, diagnosis to make and very important that it's, we are highly specific when we make the diagnosis of tumor in vein. Now let's move on to uh, part two of this talk and that's imaging post-liver transplant in the last few minutes. So post-liver transplant complications can, you know, the reasons that those patients come to MR is because of biliary complications to assess for vascular patency, to look for disease surveillance, and sometimes for PTLD. So in this, you'll see in these patients post-transplant, uh, the Mercedes-Benz uh, incision, you'll see susceptibility artifact along the cable anastomosis, superior and inferior. You'll often see these small fluid collections often along the um, ligamentum venosum, the porta hepatis, and along the ligamentum teres. That's kind of a normal appearance. In post-transplant uh, MRCP images, you may see two cystic duct remnants, the recipient and the uh, donor bile ducts might be slightly discrepant. Here you can see that the recipient duct is slightly larger than the donor duct. You can see loss of signal at the anastomotic site, and this is nothing to be concerned about if the patient's liver function tests are normal. Some patients will get a hepatic or anastomosis, and you may be, able to see it, may be able to see that. Sometimes you won't see the exact anastomosis, but you'll look for areas of dilatation and be able to tell whether this patient has got abnormalities or not. Now on occasion you'll see a case like this where it looks like there's marked dilatation of the donor common bile duct as compared to the recipient and here is an apparent area of signal loss but we don't see much dilatation of the intrahepatic bile ducts and importantly we look at the uh, hepatic artery to make sure that it is patent and that looks fine and if we ask the patient's liver function test numbers, then we find out that they're normal. So this is a patient who basically had size discrepancy of this marked degree, and there was no associated obstruction. So always remember that we need to treat the patient. We don't treat the image. It's really, really important to remember that. Now in this patient who was immediately post-liver transplant, we had an ultrasound that had this appearance. The text said it could not visualize. 
you know that that means that the patient urgently needs to have management, and that means that they need a STAT, either a CTA or a conventional angiogram, or they need to go back to the operating room. Because within hours, the bile ducts, which are solely fed by that hepatic artery, are going to have ischemic injury. Unlike you and I, who have collaterals, these patients with uh, transplantation do not have any collaterals for their hepatic artery. So the hepatic artery is the sole provider for the life of those bile ducts. So this patient ended up having a conventional angio, which showed acute thrombosis. The patient was taken to surgery, and this was a week later that we had this ultrasound showing beautiful flow within that transplant artery. Unfortunately, this is what happens. Despite all of the attempts, the patient developed ischemic change to the bile ducts, Notice that we have a large fluid collection with infection. The patient's hepatic artery rethrombosed and had areas of uh, starting to develop some collaterals. And this was a patient who had an infected biloma and hepatic abscess as a result of ischemic injury. So that hepatic artery, it's critical to take a look at that. And the relationship of the bile ducts and that hepatic artery is really important for all of us to understand. Now, in this patient, I want you to see had biliary strictures that we could see after transplant. There was dilatation of the intrahepatic bile ducts, and we very carefully walked down to see if there were any focal lesions, which we did not see. We did not see any debris. Whenever you see a case of biliary strictures, really important, you need to look at the transplant artery. So we did a vascular map that showed patency throughout the portal venous system as well as in the artery. The artery looks great. So this ended up being on... Um, uh, uh, related to multiple areas of infection rather than related to ischemic injury, but it's really important to look for that. In this patient, we actually saw that there was dilatation of the intrahepatic bile ducts proximal to the anastomosis, but this also had areas of debris within it on, um, on the MRCP. And you could see on the axial T1 weighted images that the patient actually had dependent areas of high signal intensity that represented slow stones or sludge proximal to a stricture. And the patient's liver function tests were abnormal. So all of those led the endoscopist to go in, clean this out, put a stent in, and relieve the patient of these obstructing stones. Now this patient is interesting. They presented with abnormal liver function tests, as, you, as we've talked about earlier, when that happens. The next thing you're going to do is to make sure that that artery looks good, and the artery looked great. So when we looked a little bit more carefully on the axial images, we could see that within these dilated bile duct that there were areas of filling defects, and notice that some of these had proteinaceous signal on T1 rated images. This represents biliary cast syndrome, and biliary cast syndrome is, this, is an entity that people really don't understand why it happens. They just know it's really bad when it happens because a lot of these patients will end up um, needing retransplantation. And the thought is that maybe it's ischemia, maybe it's infection, but they develop these areas of biliary sand within the bile ducts and they end up clotting off their bile ducts. So these patients are aggressively managed with multiple ERCPs and um, taking out some of this junk within the bile ducts and bile thin thinning agents in order to get the bile to flow a little bit better. But when you see this, it's really important to, number one, look for it, and number two, make sure you let your clinical colleagues know about it so they can manage these patients appropriately. Now, this patient had a uh, rising bilirubin. We had an MRCP six years ago that showed mild irregularities. She had some recurrence of her PSC and a cystic duct remnant that was larger than we usually saw, but she was otherwise asymptomatic at that point, didn't have progressive dilatation. However, her liver function test bumped up significantly on follow-up imaging. We see progression of changes of PSC, but her cystic duct remnant got even larger and was attenuating the common hepatic duct. And there you can see on the axial T1-weighted images, high signal intensity of proteinaceous debris within that cystic duct remnant representing a mucosal of the cystic duct. And this ended up being revised surgically in this patient. Other alternatives would be to have our friends in interventional radiology or in endoscopy try and manage this patient, but this patient ended up going to surgery. Now, this patient I want you to draw to your attention. This is important. This is a patient who presented with ascites post-liver transplantation. We always are worried about portal veins and outflow um, in these patients. Now, notice that there's areas of periportal abnormal signal intensity, some somewhat targetoid throughout this liver. The liver is very rounded in its morphology. And after infusion of intravenous contrast, we were able to see 
kind of a congested appearance of the liver. And notice that the caudate is hyperenhancing, and on the late phase, it's hypoenhancing, the so called flip flop sign of Bud Carey. We were able to see the hepatic veins pacifying, and the IVC also filled with contrast. But this was definitely a congested liver. So what ultimately happened to this patient is they got manometry and they ended up getting a stent for a Bud Carey. An important point to remember on this case is that patients who are post-transplant may not have the massive distension of the hepatic veins or IVC, even though there's a significant stenosis of the um, uh, cable anastomosis because of the fibrosis that occurs within the liver. So the best bet to be able to tell if the patient has a bud carry pattern is actually to do venography and, and uh, manometry to be able to look at what's happening to those, uh, to those pressures. This patient, unfortunately, had disease recurrence. They had hepatitis C. They were treated without, uh, uh, with um, a transplant. And unfortunately, the patient had HCC at the time of um, uh, initial transplant. And on follow-up, you can see seven years later, they came back with multifocal HCC. This was a patient who had hepatitis C, and this was prior to the treatment uh, that was available. And you could see seven years later, they presented with cirrhosis again because of the hepatitis C. This patient had primary sclerosing cholangitis, which recurred in the transplant. You can see the classic beaded appearance in this patient with an underlying history of inflammatory bowel disease. This is a similar patient, young patient with PSC, and you could see that progressive changes occurring within the bile ducts in this patient post-transplant. This is a patient who had, was six months after transplant for HCC, and there were large bulky lymph nodes and pleural-based masses that developed in the lungs as well as in the retroperitoneum with big soft tissue lymph nodes. And then at the time of PET, we were able to see multiple hypermetabolic lesions throughout the abdomen and, and throughout the uh, chest and pelvis. And you could see that after they decrease their immunosuppression, the patient gets better. And so this was post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder or PTLD. Very important entity to think about. Think about it as when you see somebody with enlarging lymph nodes or enlarging heterogeneous masses that are outside of the usual nodal stations. And remember that it's rare, but it's associated with Epstein-B um, virus. It's a really interesting concept because it basically allows the EBV virus to drive the tumor because of the immunosuppression. And once the immunosuppression is actually reduced, then the EB virus is under better control and they may not need chemotherapy. So it's an important thing to think about. So in conclusion, when a patient presents for pre-liver transplant imaging, it's important to make a specific diagnosis of cirrhosis, to think about the pathways of carcinogenesis between dysplastic nodules and HCC, to make a specific diagnosis of HCC, relying, of course, on arterial phase hyperenhancement and washout. Remember also that HCCs are angioinvasive and that other malignancies can occur in these patients. Remember also that surgical planning and requires vascular mapping and, of course, to use LIRADS. In patients presenting post-liver transplant imaging, when one sees a complication with the bile ducts, always think about the arteries. Remember that vascular mapping should be part of your routine in these patients. Think about disease recurrence because it can be subtle and unfortunately late. And always to think about PTLD. So with that, I thank you so much for your interest in this seminar. Feel free to reach out to me at your um, need. And my contact information is below. Thanks so much. Bye now.